All right, Facebook, PDT here, Prophet David Taylor. Hello to Periscope and hello to Facebook. I know that the picture still isn't maybe what it needs to be. I'm still working on my lighting and everything. Should be better. Uh, got a new camera, but I still got to get my lighting right. I get that. But uh, we're moving forward. So welcome to the broadcast. Welcome to all of you that are listening to this on the podcast. Welcome to all of you that are watching it live on Facebook, Periscope, and YouTube. Now, if you're watching me live, I want you to please like and share. Okay, when you come on on the video, please like and share, because whenever God releases a prophetic word, it needs to go around the world. There are people that need to hear it, and there are people that it's going to bless. Okay? All right? Let's say a word of prayer, and then we'll dive right in for today's prophetic word. Thank you, Lord, for this day. Thank you for an opportunity, oh God, to serve you. Thank you for an opportunity, oh God, to be a part of your kingdom. Lord, we come before you humbly, surrendering, and asking that you uh, speak through me, oh God. I surrender my mind, my brain, my lips, my mouth, my teeth, my tongue, my hand motions, everything I surrender to you, oh God. Please breathe through me. Speak through me. Let the Spirit of God take over, oh God, so what you want said will be said, so that the message that you want released to the body of Christ and to the world will be released, oh God. And I just thank you for this chance to be a part of your program and your kingdom, because it could be so much different. So I thank you for it, and I believe you for it, and I give you all the glory. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen and amen. All right. <clears throat> so today's message, if you've already looked at the title, today's prophetic word, and today's message is entitled, Missing God. Missing God. Now, the very first thing I want to say is I have discovered that a lot of people have been taught in their lives wrong ideas about the will of God and wrong ideas about who God is. So let me start off right off the bat by telling you that the will of God is not automatic. The will of God does not just automatically happen. Okay. Can I back that up with scripture? Yes, I can. The scripture that I used last week for last week's broadcast, and that will be Romans chapter 12 verses one and two. Okay. And they are, uh, verse number one, reading out of the NIV, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Notice that you have to offer it. <laughs> you to offer your bodies. I urge you, brothers and sisters. So since he said he urges you, and the King James says, I beseech you, okay, to you, for you to offer your body. So it's your choice, you have to do it. A living sacrifice, that means you're dead while you live. You're living, but you've died to a self-controlled life. You've died to a flesh-controlled life. you died to a self-directed life. So you're a living sacrifice. You're alive, but you're dead to what you want. So you can be alive to what God wants. Paul says that is your true and proper worship. King James says it's your reasonable service. Verse 2 says, oh, no, I'll skip past that. Verse 2 says, let me go to Romans 12, 2, that do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Do not conform to the pattern of this world. That means don't live like unbelievers. Don't live like carnal people. Don't live according to the pattern that the flesh of man sets out or the pattern that the devil sets out but be transformed. Okay, if you're gonna be transformed, let me move this for a periscope so I don't have to keep turning my head. If you're gonna be transformed, that means you go from something to something, okay? That right there also ought to tell you that it's not automatic. It doesn't just happen because you got saved or else the Bible wouldn't say to be transformed, but it's gonna be transformed, you know, like the transformers, like the toy or whatever. If you're going to be transformed, that means you go from something to something. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You have to make your mind new. Then you, once again, your responsibility, then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. It's good, pleasing, and perfect will. You've got to test it, and you've got to prove it, and you've got to know it for yourself. It doesn't just happen. And then it says it's good, pleasing, excuse me, and perfect will. Now, there's been a lot of different interpretations, but the one thing I do want you to get from that 
statement, his good, pleasing, and perfect will, is that there are levels to the will of God. Some things, some people are serving God, and the level of serving God at is good. And But that's not all that God has for them. What they're doing is good, but that's not all. Said good and pleasing. If the Bible says you got to prove uh, what God's pleasing will is, that means it's possible to not be pleasing God with your lifestyle. And we see that reflected in Revelation chapter 2 and 3, where the Lord is giving grades to the pastor, the angel, the messenger, at the churches, the seven churches in Asia, and he's talking about the pastor and their behavior, what's going on in the church. It's possible to be a Christian, but you're not leaving, you're not living a life that's pleasing to Christ. And then it says the perfect will. What is the perfect will? It's where you're becoming everything that God wants you to become. Everything that God created you to be, you're on the path to becoming that. And everything that God uh, created you to do, you're doing that. That's the perfect will, becoming all that you were meant to be and doing all that you were created to do. So right there in the scripture, the scripture teaches us clearly that it is not automatic. It doesn't just happen. You've got to prove it out. See that? Okay. Uh, okay. Greetings from Cape Town, South Africa. How you doing, bro? God bless. Brother Paul, uh, I can't say your last name. <laughs> uh, Demiso in Demiso, but uh, amen and amen. God bless you, so good to see you. Please like and share the video because we need it to go around the world to as many places as possible so God can bless all with the prophetic word. Okay, so right off the bat, uh, I just showed you in the scripture that the will of God is not automatic, okay? It is not automatic. It doesn't just happen, okay? It must be proven out. And you must prove it out. And I just showed you how. I just showed you the steps in the scripture we read in, Reve in Romans 12, 1 and 2. Okay? So that's just kind of a, a refresher of last week, but a prelude as to what we're going to talk about today. Because today's prophetic word is missing God. So we needed to lay that foundation right quick to let you know that it is entirely possible to miss God. And you can miss God on a variety of levels. You can miss God a little bit. You can miss God with some major decisions. You can miss God for a season. You can miss God for uh, a big portion of your life. You can miss God for your whole life, okay? You can spend your whole life and completely miss the Lord as a Christian, okay? I know some of y'all, you never heard that before. Nobody ever said that, but it's true, and I'm going to show you in Scripture how true it is, that you can spend your whole life and still miss God, okay? So as a matter of fact, let me show you this scripture that will validate what I just said, okay? All right. We're gonna to go to Matthew chapter seven. We're going to start at verse uh, 21. I'm reading out of the NIV, Matthew, first book in the New Testament, chapter 7, and we're going to start at verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will, verse 22, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? and in your name drive out demons, and in your name perform many miracles. Verse 23, then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, ye evildoers. Lord, have mercy. What a thing for the Lord to say. The Lord said, not everybody that says, Lord, Lord, is going to enter the kingdom, but those that do the will of his Father, which is in heaven which just tells us right there that we need to be sure that we're doing what Father God wants us to do. And then he said, many people are going to say to me in that day, Lord, haven't we done many wonderful works, prophesied in your name, cast out devils in your name, done many miracles? Now, I know what your question is, because your question is mine too. If they don't really know the Lord or they're not really right or whatever, how could they do all these things? The answer to that question is because there's power in the name of Jesus. Jesus received the name that is above every name. 
And at the name of Jesus, every knee must bow and every tongue must confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And we have power to step on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt us. That's why it's possible to use the power that's in his name, but not know the owner of the name because his name will work because God established it. Father God established when he raised Jesus from the dead that Jesus had a name that was above every name because he earned it because he followed God's will completely. He beat sin, the grave, Satan, the demons, hell and death and took the keys of hell and death. So Jesus got a name that's above every name. And when you call on the name of Jesus, it works, whether you actually know Jesus or not, because the power is in the name. The same way, if you have an authorized letter from any type of official, anybody that's the head of anything or any government anything, uh, where you have an official authorized letter from someone in a seat of power, you don't have to know them for the power in that letter to work. All you do is present the letter to whatever you want to go and the, whoever you're dealing with see that you've been authorized by the name on the letter. You don't have to know them and you don't have to have a good relationship with them because their name alone is enough to open doors. Well, the name of Jesus is the same way. It's the name that's above every name and that's why a whole lot of Christians make their mistake because in that verse we saw that they say that they're doing all these things in his name. But then we see, oh, in verse Matthew 7, 20, 23 and verse 23, where the Lord says, then I'm going to say to them, depart from me, ye evildoers. King James says, ye workers of iniquity, I never knew you. So in other words, the Lord is saying, just because you use my name doesn't mean that you and I had a relationship. And the Lord said, we, I never knew you. We were never intimate. You and I were never close. So all that, what you did doesn't count. Oh, there's an example of how you can miss God with your whole life. Your whole life, you can miss God with your whole life. You can run around doing a bunch of religious things in his name, but never actually take the time to get to know Jesus. And if you don't take the time to get to know Jesus for yourself, then it doesn't matter what you do in his name. He's going to tell you to get out of his face because y'all were never intimate. Unbelievable. There's an example of how you can miss God with your whole life. Let's look at some other people in the Bible that miss God. Now, uh, these verses I'm going to read now are talking about the, the nation of Israel, the Hebrew children, after they came out of Egypt and through the wilderness, okay? God did not just want to bring them out of Egypt, and God did not just want to bring them through the wilderness. God wanted to bring them into Canaan, into the promised land, into the land that God had sworn to Abraham that his descendants would inherit. So let me stop right here and do some more Christian myth busting. You've heard, I'm sure you've heard so many songs about the promised land and we're going to the promised land, blah, blah, blah. That's not talking about heaven. That's not talking about when we die. The promised land is right here, right now on earth. What it represented to them was a physical piece of land that God had promised Abraham his descendants would inherit, which they're still fighting over, over now, by the way. What it means for us as New Testament believers is getting in the perfect will of God, living your dream, living the thing, the desire of your heart that God has created you for, the thing that God wants you to do, the thing that God has saved you for and filled you for and kept you alive for, your life's purpose and goal. That's what it means to enter to the promised land in this life. It's not talking about heaven. It's talking about getting into the place that God has ordained for you to be in this life and becoming all that you're supposed to become. That's what it means, the promised land in this life. So let's look at what happened to the children of Israel who physically came up out of Egypt, physically came across the wilderness. They got to the edge of the promised land, but they didn't make it. Why? Okay, we're going to look at Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews is in the New Testament. Hebrews chapter 4. Uh, there's a question as to who wrote the book of Hebrews. Some people think that Paul wrote it. Some people think Apollos wrote it. Some people think that Luke wrote it. Okay, but scholars tend to argue there's not like a full agreement as to who actually wrote uh, the book of Hebrews. So we're going to look at the book of Hebrews. I'm reading out of the NIV. We're going to go to chapter 4. We're going to read verses 1 through 11. Therefore, since the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us be careful that none of you be found to have fallen short of it. 
For we also have had the good news proclaimed to us just as they did. But the message they heard was of no value to them because they did not share the faith of those who obeyed. Now we who have believed enter that rest just as God has said. So I declared an oath in my anger, they shall never enter my rest. And yet his works have been finished since the creation of the world. For somewhere he has spoken about the seventh day in these words. On the seventh day, God rested from all his works. And again, in the passage above, he says, they shall never enter my rest. Therefore, since it still remains for some to enter that rest, and since those who formerly had the good news proclaimed to them did not go in because of their disobedience, God again set a certain day calling it today. This he did when a long time later he spoke through David, as in the passage already quoted. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken later about another day. There remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For anyone who enters God's rest also rests from their works, just as God did from his. Let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest so that no one will perish by following their example of disobedience. Okay, there's a lot in those verses. There's a lot to unpack. But I want to show you, uh, I want you to see clearly, that's not talking about dying and going to heaven. That's not what that's talking about. That's talking about right here on earth. Okay, so we can't do a deep dive today. I don't have enough time. Uh, maybe I'll do a no more genies on this, but let me break down some of it for you. It says, therefore, since the problem, verse one, uh, Hebrews 4, 1, therefore, since the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us be careful that none of you be found to have, a, to have fallen short of it. In the Greek, let us be careful is actually the word phobos. It means to be fearful. And in the King James, it said, let us therefore fear now, it's one of the few times the Bible tells us to fear. In other words, what he's saying is, is that there is a rest that God has for you in this life. And it talks about it in verse uh, 9 and 10. There remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For anyone who enters God's rest also rests from their works, just as God did from his. What does that mean? That means that you are no longer carrying the, the weight of your life. It means that God is the one supplying your needs, that God is the one giving you finances, energy, strength. Now, you're doing your part because you're being obedient, but you have moved, you have fully let go of whatever life you want to live, and you have moved into the will of God, kind of like being back in the Garden of Eden where the Lord supplies everything you need to do what he's called you to do, and you don't have to worry. The weight of your life is fully off of you. You're not worrying about or trying to carry it yourself, you're being obedient to God and he's supplying and you're doing what you were born to do. And you were doing what God created you to do, like I said earlier in the broadcast, okay? So that's the promise that God, that's what the Romans 12, one and two is about. That's the promise that God is saying, I promise you that in this life, I wanna take you to a place where you're financially stable, where you're spiritually stable, where you're mentally and emotionally stable, where you're physically healthy, where you're married to the right person, where you have the right family, where you have the fullness of everything that Jesus died to give you. God said, I promise you, you can have that kind of rest in this life. You can know me, you can know yourself, you can know my will for your life, and you can be walking in it. God said, I promise you that in this life, you can have that. Now we know, everybody listening to me and looking at me, we know that all Christians aren't living that way. Why? Why aren't all Christians living that way? If God is no respecter of person, and since the Bible doesn't change, and God doesn't change, and Father, Son, and Holy Ghost don't change, what's the issue? The issue is always the same. It's us. Some people believe that, and some people don't. Some of y'all looking at me right now, you've been fighting your call from God. You've been fighting God for years. You feel like God is calling you to ministry, or you feel like God is calling you to move to another city or state, or you feel like God is calling you to let go of a relationship, you feel like God is calling you to do a whole bunch of stuff that you don't want to do. And you've been fighting him for a very long time. The reason that you're fighting him is because you don't believe he's trying to offer you rest. He's trying to get you to a point where you are no longer your source, your own source, where you don't have to live anymore under the curse by the sweat of your face and all the things that God put on Adam in the garden where that can be lifted off you and you can now enter into his grace and live off of his supply where you can rest in his hand. As the song says, where you can be safe in his arms. 
Okay, but the only way to achieve that, to experience that, to walk in that in this life is you must obey. <laughs> you must do what God is telling you to do. You can't have that rest on your program. And that is the difference between Christians. I guarantee you. I guarantee you the difference between Christians is that some Christians believe that the life that God is calling them to is better than the one they can live on their own. Even though it requires a cross, even though it requires you to become a living sacrifice, even though it requires that you take your hands off the wheel and you let Jesus take the wheel and go wherever the Lord says go, even though that's what he's calling you to, some Christians believe and understand that that life will still be better than the life you would have lived if you had kept your hands on the wheel. And some Christians don't believe that. Some Christians believe I can accept him as savior, but I don't want to accept him as Lord. I believe he died on the cross for my sins and I believe in his shed blood and I'm not going to hell, but I don't want to let him take control of my life because I might have to give up something I don't like. You will have to give up some stuff you don't like. I might have to do some stuff I don't want to do. You will have to do some stuff you don't want to do. I might have to go some places I don't want to go or talk to some people I don't want to talk to or whatever. You will have to do all that. But the good news is, is that life will still be better. That life will be full of the Holy Ghost. That life will be full of the anointing of God. That life will be full of the power of God. That life will be full of the finances of God. That life will be full of the joy of God. It's the life that you want, even though it takes a cross to get to it. Okay? But if as a believer, you don't believe that, you're going to keep on fighting God and you're going to disobey. So God is going to tell you to go one way and you're going to go another. God's going to tell you to do something and you're going to do the opposite. You're just going to do what you think. And you are never going to enter into God's rest that way. Okay? So in the scripture I read in Hebrews 4, it says, let us therefore fear. Okay, the Greek word there is phobos. In other words, you need to be concerned about this. You need to take this seriously. You need to intensely seek the will of God to be sure you don't miss. Because if you miss the will of God, I told you from the top, you can miss God with your whole life. That means when you stand before God in judgment, if you didn't do what the Lord wanted you to do, your life's not going to count. Oh, can you imagine living your 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, yeah, even 100 plus years of life on earth, and then you die, and then you stand before Jesus in judgment, and the Lord just shake his head and say, well, I'm sorry, you were disobedient. You didn't do none of what I wanted you to do, so all them years don't count. Get out of my face. You just worked iniquity. You just ran your program. You lived your life to try to glorify yourself, and you never took up your cross to let me glorify myself through you. Can you imagine? Can you imagine living your whole life and then the Lord said it don't count because you never took your hands off the wheel. You never, you just accepted him as savior. You never accepted him as Lord and you, you never got into obedience. Okay. So <clears throat> uh, verse two of Hebrews four, for we also have had the good news proclaimed to us just as they did. But the message they heard was of no value to them you can hear the word of God and it doesn't profit you. It doesn't bring any value in your life because they did not share the faith of those who obeyed. Not because the word of God doesn't have power, not because what God says isn't true, but because you don't believe it. <laughs> because they did not share the faith of those who obeyed. Okay, now what does that mean in practical terms? It means that you have to obey. If you're living in one city, and God tells you to move, you have to obey. Because whatever city God is calling you to, the life that's there for you is gonna be better than the one you're living now. If you wanna get married and you're dating someone and the Holy Ghost lets you know that person is not it, that person is not the one, then if you have to let that person go, whatever person God has chosen for you to marry will be better than the person you would have picked on your own. Whatever you do for a career or a profession, maybe God is calling you. Sometimes God calls people to just out and out quit their job. If God is calling you to quit your job, that's a scary thing where you got to jump on out to your own faith and God is asking you to let go of heretofore your only source of income. But that means that God is going to provide for you, but you have to jump out there. And nothing's going to start flowing until you do what the Lord told you to do. And if he told you to quit your job, then you got to quit your job. 
and nothing's going to flow until you obey. You must obey. Okay? And so the only reason you would disobey God is because you don't really believe what he's offering you is better. Because who runs away from better? Who runs away from better? Okay? So I'm just moving because I'm trying to get my face in this light. I need to get another light thing because I know it's still dark, at least on Facebook. I think it's better on Periscope. But anyway, so who runs away from better? Who fights better? If you know that what he's offering you is better than what you have now, why would you run away? Why would you fight it? The only reason that you're running and the only reason that you're fighting God is because you don't believe that what he's offering you is better. That's the only reason. I know it takes a cross. I know it takes sacrifice. We talked about, about that. We looked at that in scripture. But if you believe that it's worth it, how do I know that's true? Because that's exactly what you do when you believe anything else is worth it. If you want a car, what will you do? You sacrifice. Save up the money. If you want a new house, what do you do? You sacrifice. Save up your down payment. If you want to go back to school, what do you do? You sacrifice. Because you have to sacrifice time and energy and focus if you want to complete a degree at any level. You know why you do that? Because you believe it's worth it. <clears throat> That's why you do it. So this principle, this principle is the same idea that if you really believe that what God is calling you to is better then whatever life you would have lived on your own, you will make whatever sacrifice is necessary to get into the perfect will of God. But I want to say this one more thing, and then I'll probably have to pick this up later. Um, because there's so much in these verses. Verse 3, we're back on Hebrews chapter 4, verse 3. Now we who have believed enter that rest, just as God has said. So I declared on oath in my anger, they shall never enter my rest. And yet his works have been finished since the creation of the world. That can sound a little bit confusing. So let me break it down to you in practical terms. What that means is that God got so mad. God got so mad at the generation that came out of Egypt because they saw all the plagues of Egypt. They saw, you know, the blood on the doorpost that instituted the Passover. The Passover, they saw the death of the firstborn. They, they saw manna from heaven. They saw quail from the sea. They saw water coming out of the rock. And then they saw Moses stretch out his rod and the Red Sea parted. And then the sea closed back down where, where there was a pillar of fire holding Pharaoh back. And then once the children of Israel got through, sea closed down and drowned Pharaoh and him in the Red Sea. And then people got to the edge of prom the promised land and didn't believe God. They said, oh, there's giants and oh, there's people bigger than us. And oh, where's grasshopper grasshoppers in their sight. And oh, I wish we had died in the wilderness. And God got so mad at that unbelief. Because God sent 12 spies. Two spies came back with a positive report of faith. Joshua and Caleb, they said, we can do it. We can take the land. We're well able. We're ready. Let's go. And the other 10 said, oh, no. There's giants and, and, and it's going to be hard and they bigger than us and blah, blah, blah. And God got so mad at the people because after all those miracles that the Lord showed them, they still didn't believe. They still didn't believe God. They still didn't believe God. They still wouldn't enter in. And God said, that's when God pronounced the judgment. They was going to wander in the wilderness till they died. And God was only going to take the people in 21 and under. Oh, except for Joshua and Caleb. Did you understand that? That you need to be concerned about missing God. You do not need to stay in unbelief because you might push things to a point where God consigns you to the wilderness and God says, now you're going to wander in the wilderness till you die. You're never going to make it. And that's why you know some Christians that are what I call wilderness Christians. They've just been wandering. They sing the same songs every year. They preach the same sermons every Sunday, Sunday after Sunday. They are always trying to raise money for the building fund, but they never build anything. They wear the same robes. They do the same thing for 30 and 40 years until a generation dies. You know why? Because they refused to believe God. They wouldn't move forward. They wouldn't move forward into the new things God was calling them into. And so God consigned them to the wilderness, and you're just going to wander in circles. That means you're never going to grow. You're never going to change. 30 years from now, you're going to be doing the same stuff. That's wilderness Christians. That's wilderness living. That is not what God has for us. He has promised land living, where, where the land is full. It's bursting with milk and honey and grapes and, and nourishment and provision where you can become a land owner, where you can possess 
the land. They were slaves in Egypt. They were wanderers in the wilderness. But God was trying to say, now you can become a land owner. You can become a land possessor. Okay, that's what God was trying to get them to do. And after all that he had done for them, they still wouldn't believe and go in. So the Bible says in Hebrews, the reason that's there is because that can happen to us as New Testament Christians. After all that God has done for your life, you can still mess around and disbelieve him and miss God and miss the promised land and miss your blessing and miss all the stuff that he has for you in this life. And that is just a tragedy and a shame. Some people you've gone through, some people, the devil and wicked people have been persecuting you since you were a little child. And the reason they've been persecuting you is because you have a great destiny in Christ. Why would you go through all that and survive all that and make it through all that only to come to a point and never fully get what God had for you to get? That's a tragedy and a shame, and it doesn't make any sense. So I stopped by prophetically to encourage you to listen to the voice of the Lord, to believe God, and to move forward into the promised land. For the prophetic word that's coming to me now is, behold, my children, the time has come. Some of you are past time, but do not fear and do not worry. I have worked everything together for your good, and the time has come for you to move forward and fully into the promised land and fully possess everything that I created you for. So be not afraid, fear not, but believe me. And in the days and weeks and months to come, I will guide you every step of the way so that you might be the head and not the tail and become all that I have always meant for you to be, says the spirit of the living God. Amen and amen. All right, if you have any prayer requests, put them on the screen. That was a good word. I'm blessed and encouraged by it. I needed to hear that. If you have any prayer requests, put them on the screen now. Uh, so when you see me close my eyes and pray in tongues, I'm asking the Holy Ghost, is there any deliverance, any more prophetic words, any uh, 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 physical healing that needs to happen? and uh, uh, anything that needs to be broken off of people. Okay, what's coming into my spirit is that the biggest problem is unbelief. That so many of you out there listen to me now, you don't believe. If God has told you to move, you need to move. If God has told you to break up with that person, you need to break up with them. If God has told you that he's got a ministry for you, you need to stop fighting him, okay? The only reason you're fighting him, as I've said this whole program, is because you don't believe. You don't believe. You don't believe. And let me say it one more time before I sign off. The life that he's calling you to is better than the one that you could live on your own. All right? Let me see if there's anything else the Holy Ghost wants me to release. All right, I think that's it. So amen and praise God. Please uh, like and share this video. Uh, like and share the podcast. Like and share it on Facebook. And uh, go back and listen from the beginning, okay? Hopefully I'll get a chance to pick this up again because there's so many more in, that, in those verses that need to be expounded upon. But for today, uh, watch this video from the beginning so you can get all the scriptures and all the trains of thought, okay? All right, amen and God bless you. That's it for this week. Coming up real soon, my prophetic devotion will be dropping on January 1st. And then um, my prophetic locator word for the end of 2019 will be on December 31st. And the beginning of 2020, a new year, a new month, and a new decade will be drop, dropping on January 1st, along with my pro, pro, uh, prophetic devotional. Okay? All right. Amen. Thank you. God bless. I will see you same time next week, 2.30 p.m. Central Standard Time, for your weekly live prophetic word. Have a good week, and I encourage you, my brother, to present your bodies to God a living sacrifice so you can prove his good, acceptable, and perfect will and enter into your promised land. Amen, and God bless.